Hey, everybody. First of all, thank you for joining me yesterday for all the stuff that's going on. Second, proud to present my friend, Oakland Athletics President Dave Cobble. Dave, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, fantastic to get that 23 to 2 overwhelmingly positive vote from BCDC. That's like a baseball blowout, huh? I, I have to tell you, I wasn't expecting so many positives. You know, we were hoping to get 19, maybe 18. I mean, it's a super majority. We needed 18. But to get such a definitive yes, I think we'll build momentum on this project. And hopefully it will lead to the city council scheduling a vote. So for all of the talk about this not being about the A's and being about the port, to me, it seemed like it really was about the A's, huh? Oh, yeah, I think it was. And I think this was an important um, gating milestone that a lot of the other agencies and obviously the city council were waiting to see if it was going to happen before they were going to schedule a vote, before they were going to weigh in and actually expose themselves to this, you know, obviously, you know, somewhat controversial decision. It's a big decision. And if they didn't have to make the decision, you know, sometimes people prefer that. So now it's squarely in their lap. We're hoping to get a vote scheduled in September or October at the latest before the election. And we're going to push as hard as we can to make that happen. Now, everybody's asking me and asking you and asking everybody else, does this mean no more Las Vegas? No, no. We are on parallel paths. The parallel paths continue. Um, we have a very small window of opportunity here in Oakland. Um, if we do not get an agreement by the end of the year, we don't have a path in Oakland. If there's a new city council, if they vote no, we need to have an option of somewhere to play. And we're spending a lot of time, you know, weekly meetings, full design meetings, like nine to seven, working on some of the final sites in Las Vegas. They're, they're really incredible sites. The designs are spectacular, you can imagine. Um, and that that's a necessary process and one that may in fact be the way we go. We don't, we don't really know the answer yet. Zay. I gotta ask you, first of all, you said sites. That means you're gonna have rollout designs for more than one. Originally, you suspected to have those designs rolled out by now, right? What's the delay with respect to Las Vegas? Well, we have a couple final sites that we're doing design work. We're negotiating with the landowners and with some of the key partners in that location uh, with an eye to make a final decision on a site and then announce it, you know, with really all the bells and whistles and understanding what we're proposing to the community. We don't want to get out ahead of it and not have that lined up. Um, and so we think it's it, it's taking a little longer than we would originally have intended, but it's important to get it right, to be thoughtful, deliberate, to build momentum and support. And I think that's the best way to go at this time. Interestingly, which side are we talking about? Can you say now? Uh, you know, we don't, because it's, it's real estate negotiations, we don't right. specify specifically what side. We can say that the final sites are in the resort corridor, uh, very close to the, the strip itself. Uh, some with some just incredible views. You know, working on um, you know, joint ventures and things of that nature. So it's it, it's a very um, exciting opportunity and one that I think can be very accretive, not only to the A's, but to Las Vegas and, of course, Major League Baseball. Dome stadium or retractable roof? We're looking at a retractable roof stadium. Ah, that's fascinating. Quite fascinating. Yeah, and, and some of the design work that I'm talking about is around, like, how that is going to work. You know, that's a very important consideration because we need to take climate in, in as a major, major factor. Like we need a climate controlled environment, but also in the, the winter, in our off season, having this as a stadium with an open, you know, um, you know, configuration, I think could really help for other events, concerts. There's really no open air locations in Las Vegas. Now I'm going to ask you about public uh, contributions, if you will, or subsidy with respect to Las Vegas. We know about Oakland more than anybody. But <laughs> Las Vegas and actually Nevada has something called the Tourism Development District, which has been on the books since 2005 and includes the ability to use tax increment financing, but employing sales tax revenue. Is that what you're looking at for the ballpark in Las Vegas? We're, we're kind of at the early stages on like how a public private partnership could work in Southern Nevada. We have a variety of different um, ways it could be done. That is one, the Tourism Improvement District. I talked to the governor about that numerous times and also the Clark County commissioners. So that is a possibility. It's one, we're working with Goldman Sachs, who's our financial advisor on that and other options. And so, you know, right now we're trying to get the site and the feasibility like totally, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's. 
but that would be the next step in working through those different options and what makes the most sense for the public policymakers in Nevada. Since you have that in Las Vegas and you have Goldman lined up, are, are Goldman also helping in the Oakland context? Yes, they are. Yeah. So in the Oakland context with respect to Goldman Sachs, is the not yet announced uh, tax increment revenue calculation kind of holding things up with respect to what Goldman can estimate? And, and I asked that because- well, that's, that's, I don't think that's the biggest um, stumbling block in Oakland. The biggest stumbling block is just scheduling the vote. You know, I yeah. think we, we need an actual vote schedule because it's a forcing function thing. It gives people deadlines. It forces the lawyers to do the work, all the staff on my side and on the city side. We have an army of people working on this. You know, we'll do a Zoom call or video or whatever they call the damn thing. And, you know, there'll be 40 people on there. And so everyone needs the direction and deadlines. And so I, that's why I'm advocating so hard to get a date uh, and one before the election. I don't want this vote to be taking place in the lame duck session. I think that's a recipe for disaster. And I've explained that to many people um, because then it would be easy to say, well, let's just kick this off till the next city council. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be before the election. There's clearly a path to do that. We've done all the work with the general plan amendments and all the things, the development agreement. It's really just coming to agreement, especially on the offsite infrastructure. You know, the city has said that they will take responsibility for that in their term sheet, but they mm -hmm. have not demonstrated to us to Goldman Sachs, our financial advisor, our lawyers, that they have a plan to do that. And that that is probably the biggest outstanding issue. That's, that gets to my question. I had the mayor on yesterday for an interview that I'm working on the sound for a glitch, but that's another story I'll get out. But she said enough to be understandable with it. And what she said, first of all, she gave me comfort that that aspect was further along, even though it's not to where I would want, and I've been screaming about for a long time, and you as well, uh, to be. But with respect to enhanced infrastructure financing district legislation, there is the provision, and I said this to the mayor yesterday, for projects of community-wide significance, including offsite, which are offsite by their nature, right? Of course. That's the whole point. Yes. Right. yes right. That's, that's a great asset that we have with this legislation that I'm encouraging the city to use for their offsites. I'm which gets, right. Which gets to the reason why, you know, I'm not going to have any hair anymore because the legislation that I originally talked to you about, I know. To, you know, is not being planned around. What is well, the mechanism? The mecha Zeni, you're 100 right. The mechanisms exist for I think the city to find a solution on the offsites. Right. But for whatever reason, maybe it's a lack of political will. We have not seen it, and we are advocating very strongly that that needs to be addressed because it's probably the biggest outstanding issue. I've presented a plan to the city staff and the mayor that will pay for the community benefits that passed the city council last year. You would think that with that, with these other sources of revenue for the offsites, we could get to a deal, but until they agree to it, we were not there. And that's what bothers me, uh, Dave, is that there is this hunt for infrastructure money at the federal government level when you and Nancy and a number of other people and Rob was now our attorney general Went through a lot of effort to establish SB 293 Skinner. We did. And, and this, your special version, basically, of enhanced infrastructure financing district law legislation. And yet, what's happened is that there's been so much lag time. This is getting to a question between the establishment of that law or that version of uh, enhanced infrastructure financing district legislation. And now that the public has gotten wind of it, but they don't understand it. And so now the politics have seemingly started to eat away at it and cause this vote that's going to come up on Tuesday, which I'm not for. The mayor says it's going to cost a million dollars to do. What are your thoughts about what the council is going to deliberate on 7-5? My, con my contention is they don't understand enough to even pitch that. Well, I, I just think it's a delay tactic. It's as simple as that. Like, there doesn't need to be any more advisory votes. There needs to be a definitive binding vote. We've been at this for five years. It's very simple. If they do that, I think it indicates that they're not serious about moving forward with this project. And that's that's fine. That's totally their call. I think it would be sad because we're very close. But it, at the end of the day, and we always knew this, Zenny, we have to get five city council members to agree that this is a good project at the waterfront. We feel that it's an unprecedented opportunity to invest private capital, keep the A's in Oakland, generate tens of thousands of jobs, help the air quality and the environment, 
there's nobody else proposing anything like this. You know, it'd be, it'd be a shame to let it get away, but we really need to know we can't go sideways anymore. It, would it help? Let me take this another way. First of all, if the council votes to do this, that's basically a death knell on Tuesday. Well, I don't see how then you could get approval this year because all the negotiation would stop. They would wait for this advisory measure. Once the advisory measure, and who knows how that's going to be worded and what it's going to say, it might be a gotcha question. You know how these referendum type things work. Yeah, yeah. And then they'll wait for that to happen. And then it, it may go down, then it's dead, the project. Even if you win and it passes, it's going to take another six to nine months with the new council to bring this to vote. It probably delays it an entire year. And we, we can't afford that. And I think the league, the league is concerned about that. We're concerned about that. And that's why we think the most prudent path is to schedule a vote of the city council, a binding vote on the DA and CBA. And, and that if they don't want to, if it's a no, it's okay. Like, I mean, it's like, seriously, you know, obviously, like I said, it'd be sad to lose after we're this close, but we just want to know. It's almost better to have that happen than to just have nothing happen and just like a whimper. And, you know, Zenny and like, and there's never a vote. That's kind of like, you know, you're kind of shirking your responsibility. And so we're hopeful that calmer heads will prevail. We'll have a lot of people speaking on our behalf on Tuesday. But at the end of the day, it's it's really the council's decision. Have you talked to the mayor about, I raised this in our conversation as well. I said, what's going to happen with the future beyond you? Because I said, you know, in a in the way we've done things, uh, the city administrator normally is the face or a project manager, but the mayor has made herself the face, and she never disagreed with the, you know, the fact that I said I asked her what the succession plan is. So, from your perspective, do you know what the who takes over, who begins to fade in as she fades out? No, that's why we got to get it done on her watch, and I don't think there's anyone who's going to be as much of a a patron and an advocate and a prime mover as Mayor Schaaf. She's done an incredible job. And I think her force of will has gotten us this far and we appreciate that. But if we lose that, I just don't see this project getting approved. Now also the work that you're doing in Las Vegas, could it be applied to say the devil rays? In other words, it's not really dead, is it? Well, I mean, keep in mind it's parallel paths. So like, you know, we're, it's, it's got its own momentum and energy and sights and everything to have a major league baseball team in Las Vegas. You know, we're focused because we're the A's on advancing like our vision for that. Um, there could be different visions that different other people have, but um, it's certainly important work and in work that is, I think, informing a long-term strategy in that marketplace. Because if it were the Delroys, I would think, and I'm, I'm aware of your time, right? I got this clock in my head, but uh the Devil Rays, I think, would have to change their brand, whereas the A's would not because of the proximity of Las Vegas to the Bay Area, right? Well, I mean, that remains to be seen. That could happen a lot of different ways. Um, you know, obviously, the A's have such an iconic brand, and, you know, especially the A's, you know, it's like it's, just, it's so colloquial and everything. So, you know, right now we're focused on the parallel paths, making as much progress as we can, Zenny, but also, like, I think we are at a very consequential moment in Oakland on this 25 year journey as close as we've ever been but also that's a little scary because like you know it, it could it could be fleeting like i i can't say and i will continue to advocate myself our ownership group my staff everyone involved in the project on my side to get the vote scheduled to bring it in front of the council and to get a final yes hopefully and i need a favor to close which will help you in the project it's something i've talked about before i texted you about a year ago when you said that the build out was 12 million and I texted back, hey, do you realize that's $9.7 billion in tax increment revenue? Why not start trotting out what the redevelopment money looks like with a build out? Well, and that, I think that is something that we're gonna be um, advocating for and expressing to people like, look, there's so much revenue that gets generated with this project. And that's just on the site. If you think about the areas off site, there's gonna be a, an effect there as well. So. This is just going to completely redefine Oakland's um, economic framework and the ability for the city to have the funds to provide the social services and city services that the citizens deserve. I mean, it's just such a game changer. And, and you know, 
people need to understand that that 55 acres produces that 12 billion, but because of the way enhanced infrastructure financing district legislation is written, the council, each council member, Fife, Calb, Taylor, Reed, Nikki Fortunato, back with respect to Chinatown, Shangtao, Rebecca Kaplan, can all designate special projects for their areas and benefit from Howard Terminal that way, right? It's going to benefit the whole city. Yeah. The whole city. And that's, yeah. that's the beauty. And you've seen that in San, you know, in San Francisco. They've done projects like that. Yeah. And they've created certain parts of the city that are economic engines that create the vitality and revenue that support you know, all the other things in the city. And, and Oakland can be the same way if, you know, there's a lot of forethought and, and acceptance of this plan and time yep. will tell we're going to see soon. So sure. will. I'll let you go, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me. Have a great 4th of July. Go next and go bears. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining us. We'll be back later tonight to discuss what uh, Dave talked about and a word updates about uh, the athletic situation. Um, real quick, I can say that, uh, first of all, thank you all for joining joining me. I can say that the fact of the matter is that the Devil Rays have a um, a tighter leash, if you will, for one. For, I don't really like that way of thinking of it, but I can't think of a better one uh, than the athletics do with respect to Oakland, because the Rays have their release runs out in 2027. And the commissioner has said this is that, you know, it takes three to four years to boil the ballpark. And so they're looking at a tight time frame as well. And they need to figure out something right now. So I don't think the double Rays not being in Las Vegas is a, uh, or I don't think the Devil Rays being in Las Vegas, I should say, is a far-fetched idea. I think the reverse. Uh, it's something that could quite happen. Um, what's so sad about this project right now is, as I said to Mayor Schaff yesterday, that because we don't have the quickly done enhanced infrastructure financing district legislation leading to the public financing authority and the infrastructure financing plan, because all that that I mentioned to you that should have been done two years ago, I'll say it maybe a year and a half generous, right, uh, is still not done. And arguably, we started all over again. And so Dave Caval has his team, has Goldman Sachs at the ready, and yet they're literally waiting for the city to get its tax increment financing act together. And the city does what the city does best. It did it to me when I was trying to bring the Super Bowl to Oakland. We lost to Jacksonville. The city was trying to work on its timetable, you know, rather than, in my case, the NFL's timetable, or in this case, Major League Baseball, the athletics timetable. And that's why we can, if you want to understand why we consistently lose out on projects of this scale, you're seeing it. There is always a lack of a sense of urgency that happens for reasons that, um, well, I'll never forget Clint Bolden when he was my boss as deputy director of redevelopment in the year 2000, when I had a meeting with then Oakland city manager turned city administrator, Robert Bob, that was to happen on that 14th of April at two o'clock. He told me that morning when I couldn't find the example bid book, uh, that we had gotten from San Diego, uh, he's, he, he had in his office, didn't tell me he had it. I sensed that he had it. That's another long story. And I knocked on his door for almost 20 minutes. I kid you not. I kid you not. And then at the end of that, he opens the door and he hands me the prime San Diego bid book I had been trying to get that was going to take to my meeting with Robert. Um, and Mike Silver, Sports Illustrated was on my side. Monty Poole was in that meeting. Sally Roach was representing the Coliseum for SMG. I uh, got into a battle with her. But my point is that he held it up. And what he said, Clint Bolden said to me, see, there's such some things just as important as your Super Bowl. And in general, for reasons that I think are worth psychological study that are beyond my pay grade, Oakland 
I would I think it's basically the existence of San Francisco, but Oakland has always believed that it doesn't deserve first class status. It believes that a city like San Francisco should have something, should do something. Uh, it's willing to share with San Francisco, whereas San Francisco, particularly under the guide of the late San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee, believed along with Mark Benioff that San Francisco should have sports, in particular the Warriors. And Mark Benioff was only too happy to engineer the Warriors leave out of Oakland to San Francisco and help Ed Lee, who had engineered the entire process. People talk about greedy owners and everything. Everybody needs to focus on the real driver of where sports organizations go. Aggressive versus non-aggressive city and county and state economic development efforts. Think about what has happened in the Oakland context. There was always another city. It doesn't matter if it was Los Angeles and the commission down there in Los Angeles County when the, when the Raiders originally moved or later when the Raiders moved to Las Vegas, Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, the Las Vegas, excuse me, the uh, Governor Brian Sandoval's Southern Nevada Tourism and Infrastructure Committee, or in the case of San Francisco, a very aggressive Ed Lee who talked to me about their intent during that party they had at Pier 32 when they first announced the intent to build a stadium in the media, particularly San Francisco media, mistook it for groundbreaking. It wasn't. And Joe Lacob said right then and there that Oakland has leadership challenges. And he said that, that San Francisco was aggressive. Okay. Or think about it in the context of any city that gets a sports organization. They have to make arrangements, deals regarding taxes. Do you abate taxes? Do you provide a subsidy? Do you mix it with another project? All right. Cities and counties and states do this, and yet everyone just focuses on the greedy owner. You need to focus on what your government is and is not doing to maintain your sports organizations. Because look, at the end of the day, these are businesses, okay? It doesn't matter if they were owned by a private organization or public organization, which I do think is a good idea for the future. Whether or not they're making money is still consider is still consideration. Maybe they can be more of a lost leader, right? If a government owned them, but you know that's another conversation. But my point is that, regardless, government is always involved. It's just it's not a matter of just these owners who are worth billions making their decisions. No billionaire spends their own money on a sports stadium. It's stupid. They, they use it as collateral, maybe of land or something like that, right? But they don't use their own money and just, you know, buy it outright. Be, they use it in such a way where it's a private bond issue that has to be paid off. And it doesn't matter the length, all right? A smart owner designs the facility to generate enough revenue to pay off, to pay off, to pay off that bond with respect to the stadium. Stadiums depreciate. People forget that. Stadiums depreciate over time, all right? But what, 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 what goes the reverse? What appreciates? The sports organization, all right? So the owner that gets involved to have a stadium built is looking to increase the value of their sports team. Not the state, not the stadium edifice itself. Okay. So it's really pouring, it's pouring good money into bad money to spend your money outright on a stadium that you know is going to depreciate. Okay. That's why billion, that's why billionaires don't do that. But what billionaires have is the ability to collateralize to Mac bond issues because they have enough, you know, back end collateral, right? Just like a city or anything else. In the case of Howard Terminal, the city of Oakland, by the way, the legislation is written, is not supposed to back the bond issues. That comes from the district itself. Why? Simple reason. First of all, the, it's the district that is 
set with collecting tax revenues from the property owners, including the, the athletics. Therefore, the district in collecting the property tax can work with the county to change the rate if need be, depending on some forecasted deficiency. There are a lot of actions the public financing authority can take to prevent a bond from going to default. They can also arrange with the underwriter to have the underwriter own the baseball stadium and the other developments within a prescribed area should that happen. So there are ways to engineer a positive outcome with respect to a bond issue that can be very, very large, that can then be used for projects of community-wide significance. That's right there in Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District law. That's baked into law, okay? And yet the city hasn't done this. It is a major problem that the city has not advanced in this area. It is, as you heard and I, Dave and I talk about and Dave acknowledge, it is the one matter other than these dates for approval, okay, that's holding this project up. And, and you know what? If we had a public financing authority, as I said to Mayor Schaff, we would have monthly meetings. You would know where the status of the facility is. It would be common knowledge. We wouldn't be anticipating as much all of these, you know, here and there meetings like the council meeting on 7-5, which, you know, is done because of the politics that have been allowed to build up because the project is behind schedule, okay? Because the project is behind schedule. So what happens is that project's behind schedule, yet it's out in the public eye. It's beaten up more and more and changed around in social media. And what happens is the identification of what it is is different from what it really is, okay? So people think, oh, this project is something that the city of Oakland is going to have to pay for, and it's going to be just like the Raiders bond, forgetting that the Warriors bonds paid off really well, okay, right? But that's not the case at all. But the question is, why do they think that way? Two reasons. A, the city did zero public education as to how this works, waited until the mayor said last year, oh, by the way, we have to get the county of Alameda's buy-in. Well, that was always the case with enhanced infrastructure financing district legislation. All the way back to SB 6, uh, uh, 628 Beal in September 14th, 2015, when it was signed into law by Governor Jerry Brown. It's been that way for that long, and it doesn't matter which version of the law you look at, the original one or the latest, which is AB 464 Mullen, signed into law last year, June, June, okay? It doesn't matter which one you look at. They all have that provision, folks, all right? What does it mean? It means the city has no real excuse for not having done the work it should have done to get the project this far. And folks, again, I repeat to you, this is Oakland. It is common for Oakland to do this. It always finds a reason not to do something. Political person after political person after political person Going back to decades, when it came to, say, for example, building a stadium for the Raiders, would always ask the question, well, you know, where are they going to go? You know, where are they going to go? That should never be the question. You should never think, well, or the A's in particular, where are they going to go? They have the major league agreement. You don't use that as your raison d'etre for doing nothing. And yet that's what Oakland has done, folks. That is what Oakland has done. All right. Odd infinitum. We always look for a reason not to do something. We're lazy. We don't embrace the excitement of the constant rebuild of the city. So for a city that prides itself on being liberal and socialist, we're really conservative. We don't have improved systems and social systems to make sure that our people are not homeless. So we have a gigantic homeless population. We don't have systems that ensure that it's easy for someone to build. So we have this backlog and we have these increasing costs that are heaped on these structures because of it. And we've done nothing to solve it. And we have bodies that we say are deliberative and they are, 
And they're there because of this overarching and very justified fear of wrecking the environment around us that comprises what, we, what is the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. But nonetheless, there has to be a balance struck, and we haven't really met that goal of doing so even up to today. All right. So what happens is that we have legislation on the books to make our lives better. This is why I really take issue like with the democratic socialists, because my argument with people who say they're democratic socialists, you don't know your own government, because if they knew their own government, they would understand that the tools to achieve the kind of socialist system they want to achieve are already there, already in place. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you have people now who call themselves activists. They don't want to study anything. And then they think that when you're talking about legislation, everything that you're against them, I'm not against them. It's quite the opposite. My point is, instead of going out on the streets and, you know, rabble rouse and everything, how about sitting down, understanding legislation and filing a lawsuit to say, why aren't we using this? And then here's how it should be used. OK, we have the tools to make a better society in the Bay Area and in particular in Oakland, but we don't use them. And all of that is coming to a factual head with respect to Howard Terminal. And that's where we are. All right. It's 604 in the East. I'll be back later. Subscribe to Zenny62 and please bookmark OaklandNewsNowBlog.com. That ends this broadcast. And thank you very much, Dave, for joining me.